Whew, good morning. I'm Josh Constein, <clears throat> the former editor at large of TechCrunch and now a venture partner at early stage VC firm SignalFire. And today we are going to discuss the biggest existential and philosophical questions about the future of AI. Uh, you know, we're, tonight, we're here to discuss the co-evolution of AI and humanity. Although I'll say it seems like one of them is evolving a lot faster than the other. <laughs> AI is mastering new skills every day and I'm still trying to master the time change from daylight savings the other day. Uh, but <clears throat> luckily we're here with somebody much, much smarter than me. Uh, he has built a lot of the products that you're probably carrying around in your pocket today. He formerly led product at Instagram, at Facebook Messenger, at Oculus, at, uh, for the Rider product at Uber, and most recently at Airtable. Please give a warm, uh, warm welcome to the head of ChatGPT and the VP of Consumer Products at OpenAI, Peter Deng. Thank you, thank you. Great to be here. Amazing. So there are plenty of questions to get into, so I'll just start with an easy one. Okay. Uh, what is the role of humanity in the age of AI? That's <laughs> super interesting. <laughs> Um, well, I want to say thank you for, to, for, for inviting me out here because uh, in my day-to-day -day -day work, we just deal a lot with the features and things, and it's really good to kind of zoom out and think about humanity as a whole. And uh, just the last couple of days in Austin, being able to walk around and just see art, um, I think that there's so much that AI does for humans, and it actually deeply makes us even more human, if that even makes more sense, that just taking a step back and talking about it, I'm excited to just explore this with you today. Amazing. So you know, how does the purpose of the human mind evolve now that so many of the quantifiable questions can be answered by things like AI? What, what does that leave for us to do? I actually believe that AI fundamentally makes us more human. Um, I think that if you take a look at AI as a tool, I see AI as a tool, it's a really powerful tool, it unlocks the ability for us to go deeper and explore some of the things that uh, we're wondering about. So I think you know, one thing you could take a look at is Kids. So you have kids? I do. I, I have kids. Um, I think kids are the purest form of what it means to be human, right? And you take a look at your kids and how old are, is, are your kids? Uh, zero and two and a half. Zero and two and a half. Those are great ages. Um, and so for your two and a half year old, would you say that uh, they ask uh, questions sometimes, often, or all the time? I made a mistake of trying to train her to be a journalist, so we asked the five questions, like where, what, why, when, how, and yeah. why is her favorite, as every parent knows, and yeah, there's no end to it. There's no end to it. It's actually fun, it's a game, to see if they, I can exhaust her before she's finished asking why questions. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have kids too, and I would say that, uh, you know, my kids ask a lot of questions. They ask a lot of great questions, and I think fundamentally, our minds are curious. Um, and that's a good expression of it. And I think what AI does is it lets us go deeper and ask those questions and keeps on going. Um, I'll give you an example of this. So just two days ago, I read an article that was on LinkedIn called, Because of ChatGPT, I Can Now Enjoy Shakespeare. Um, and it was this really fascinating read. Um, and I don't know if about you, but when I was in high school learning you know, Shakespeare, it was a struggle. Right? I would go home and read the, the uh, chapters, and I wouldn't understand half the words that were being said, and I'd go to class and um, you know, between 1 and 2 p.m., uh, go to English class, and the English teacher would have some lecture planned, but maybe I can squeeze in one, maybe two questions about that I was curious about the text. And now, with AI, uh, this person actually you know, just reads Shakespeare, has ChatGPT voice mode open and just starts asking questions. Every question that he's curious about, about the scene, un, uh, unearthing the character's intentions, that bit of exploration and what AI can let him do is just really powerful. I think that's, that's fundamentally enabling us to be that curious human uh, mind that, that we inherently have. He had a great word for this, which was uh, uh, ChatGPT is a perpetually, um, actually I can't remember exactly, but it's basically it's a tireless professor right, who's just there to answer any question and kind of let you go deep. That to me, I think is just like AI opening up more of what we fundamentally are curious about and being able to go deep there. Yeah, it seems like, you know, similar when calculators came out, that kind of pushed us from just doing the rote math to the more artistic edges of math. And, you know, now I think it feels like our time to figure out what is worth recalling. You know, AI might be able to write a book but we know what we should write a book about, and we know how to apply that book to the real world. And one of the things that I've been seeing is, do you, do you feel like we are shifting in our role from being the answerers and the creators to more of the question askers and the curators? 
Um, I think that shift might be happening. I think that might be happening, but I don't think it's a bad thing, right? And I think that like it is really interesting. Well, if, actually, if you take a step back, I think what's really interesting about AI is that it gives us this tool, this new primitive that we can start to build on top of, right? So calculation is a great example. So instead of spending time doing arithmetic, you can think about higher level sort of mathematical problems, right? And now, instead of spending time recalling every single fact, you have things like Google or you have databases where the knowledge is there and you can ask higher level questions. I have this theory that like there's this sort of a, a level of skill that humanity has and that just keeps on getting pushed up and up and up with every sort of big technology, right? And I think this, with AI being such a foundational technology and such a curve-bending technology, we're gonna be able to push our skill level up and up. I, I'll give you an example of this. I'll, I hate to talk about my kids so much, but I, I <laughs> love my kids. Um, when I was growing up, uh, learning a program in QBasic was this staring at this blue screen um, and having these lines of code that were numbered, and, and it, was, it was really hard to build something meaningful. Right? I was kind of in there kind of tinkering. And now I take a look at my nine-year-old who's learning how to code with Scratch, and there's just these logical blocks that are, that are um, uh, graphical. They can drag around and start to think about programs at a higher level at a much younger age. That's super cool, right? And he's learning how to program before he learns how to type, before typing was a barrier. It was a prerequisite. So if you take a look at AI and, and how he's gonna grow up and how all my other kids are gonna grow up, they're gonna have this amazing tool that's gonna, from a very young age, give them a head start to think about problems at a much higher level. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it seems like there's always gonna be a role for the masters within every craft that, you know, yeah. you, you can put something into open AI, you can put something into chat GPT and get an answer back, but unless you actually know your stuff, you're not gonna know if the answer is right. You're not gonna know what to draw from it, yeah. where to apply it. So it feels like even as we continue to excel uh, in our abilities with AI, you know, the role of the human person who really understands what they're talking about is still always gonna be relevant. Yeah. Um, but you know, do you believe that this actually will free us up for the even higher level questions? You know, thinking about the meaning of life, free will, where we come from. Like, does this does AI change our perception of ourselves? There's two ways to answer this question. I'll answer the the, the, the simpler one first. Um, you know, I think that we, in order to explore any of these ideas, we're going to need the time and space to do so, right? And so, you know, our minds are, for better or worse, ex extremely busy. Or, you know, organism where it, we're just constantly thinking about what if this, what if that, and evolutionarily it's got us here. But you know, to quiet the mind and have the space to think about some of these problems requires you taking time out, right? I still remember when I, um, uh, my wife inspired me, and we together we went on a ten-day meditation retreat, a silent meditation retreat, and finally we had the space to kind of think about things and kind of un unearth a bunch of these little, these little tiny little insights. Um, so I think in some sense, AI freeing us up to, to think about things at a higher level is going gonna, is gonna to help. It's going to you know, give us our time back. I also think that AI is starting to like, help us um, go deeper and, and think about problems uh, you know, locally too, right? And I think um, one of the ways that I use uh, ChatGPT is to help me uh, just help be a thought partner, right? And sometimes I'll have a, uh, the vague, a vague a nebulous thought that I just, I'm not sure how to crispen up. And the beauty of language is that this, it's this thing that actually helps you um, process your thinking, right? And I don't know about you, but you know, whenever I'm stuck mentally on something, writing it out just helps me linearize my thoughts, right? And the, the act of writing is actually clarifying the, um, uh, the thought itself. So there are many cases that personally I've actually used ChatGPT to just talk about an idea. And through that conversation, it ends up refining and, and gaining those insights. So both on the level of giving us time back to explore those concepts, but also, you know, if those of you who haven't tried it, just start asking questions. And sometimes you're going to get pretty deep into the, into the weeds and uncover some insights that you may not have otherwise. I think that's kind of the beauty of South By is you have all these conversations with people from all these different disciplines, and it really helps crystallize your ideas by having that dialogue. I mean, I wrote 4,000 articles at TechCrunch. I feel like I never knew what the last sentence was going to be by the time I started. Like you, right. you only figure out. Like I only knew what I wanted to say once I was actually talking. Yeah. And I feel like uh, humans have that same capability, but we so often lack that thought partner to really spar with. Yeah, and, and, and that thought partner, um, you know, before uh, ChatGPT, that thought partner was only awake for certain hours of the day, right? And now, you know, uh, when I'm working, <laughs> when I'm working late at night, my kids are asleep, my family's asleep, my coworkers are asleep, and I'm kind of wrestling with a certain problem of how to articulate X, Y, and Z thing. Um, ChatGPT is awake, and I can go in and just like start, you know, kind of sparring with 
with it and exploring the idea and kind of going deeper into that thought process. Yeah, it feels like we're kind of going from being the engine of progress towards the, to being the compass. Like, it's, AI could be a teleporter, but it only matters if you know what your destination is actually supposed to be. And yeah. that's why I'm excited about us pondering these big questions, because I feel like for a long time we've tried to shy away from them. And like you said, work can be exhausting when you're working hard, you know, just executing all day instead of maybe strategizing or using your higher brain. Mm -hmm. It can wear you out and leave you without the time to be able to ask those bigger questions. And you know, I think Mark said that religion is the opiate of the masses. Maybe AI is the Narcan for the masses. To, awaken us from this haze and you know make us face these really tough problems because we finally will have the time to do so. It all depends on how people use it. And I think that's one of the beauties of, of how the flexibility of the technologies that people have found. And we've seen people use it for many different purposes. Amazing. Well, if you guys have questions, we're not going to do a Q&A on stage. You know, I don't think any of you want to hear somebody else rant about their AI startup uh, instead of actually asking a question, as you've probably seen at some panels. But if you do have questions, uh, please tag them with hashtag South by Southwest AI, or you can tag me uh, on any of the channels uh, or social networks, and I'll try to answer or get back to you after the uh, program. But I want to get back to sort of why you. Uh, before going down a deeper transcendental rabbit hole. So why did you take this job? Like, to be real, you were early at Google, early at Facebook. You could have just called in Rich. Like, you don't, need, you don't really need a job, my guy. Um, so, but you are this incredibly humble, incredibly empathetic person. I've known you for over a decade. And so you don't really need the money, but so why take such a tough job? Um, I, I got really, well, I didn't know you were going to ask that question, but th thank you for saying that. Um, I, um, I think it's just really important work, um, and I was really inspired by the mission of the company, right? Just being able to, to get to safe AGI, artificial general intelligence, and distribute the benefits to all of humanity. Um, it's, I mean, I've never seen a technology in my lifetime that's this powerful and has this much promise. So. Just to be a part of it, um, I, I do keep a gratitude journal every day, and the number of times I've written, like, wow, like I feel grateful to be a part of this journey, um, verbatim, it's, just, it's, it's in there, and I, I feel that gratitude, just because, again, this is something that's gonna be so beneficial to humanity if we get it right, and I just wanna not mess it up. <laughs> so. I, that's nice to hear, but you know, you've, in the past roles, you know, at things like Facebook Messenger, yeah. the goal was just make Messenger faster, make it feel more like a real human conversation. At, yeah. at Uber, it's just get people to their destination faster, more conveniently. They felt like kind of intuitive roadmaps. Yeah. Uh, with this, with such a fast-moving, totally open-ended set of products, how do you know where to focus? Like, what use cases do you want to prioritize building for? It's a great question. I think that that is, it, and it's it's only in the, the 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 space that we can go into is only getting larger as these models get more and more intelligent, right? So it is actually a, a question that I grapple with a lot, and and you know picking the right path, a uh, lot of pressure to do that and do that correctly. Um, I think that like it's what what my fundamental approach to this job and and trying to help with the team and support the team. Um, is to take a look at sort of what humans have evolved to do for so long and how do you actually learn from that and, and bring that out to, to life, right? So uh, to give you an example, I think that we, when we built, um, uh, you know, a lot of people use ChatGPT for writing as an example, or they use it for coding. And we're trying to look a little bit more into those areas of like, great, well, how, what is the right mental model to think about uh, coding? Right, or writing, or analyzing data, and how can we assist them better in, in those ways. So I think that it's, you know, with any product role, um, the goal is to basically remove friction from the thing that people want to do, and, and, how, and how can they get most out of that technology. Um, and I think that like, that's, that's kind of at the crux of it, the, the, the challenge. What do you think the world needs from ChatGPT? Oh, man. Um, Sorry, I'm hitting you with the easy question. Yeah, I know, it's, it's great, it's great. Um, I think that what the world needs is um, a, a flexible tool that lets them remove barriers from the goals that they have. Um, and I think that's actually one of the, the inspire, most inspiring things about working on this product is to see the breadth of use cases that people have. 
Um, we've talked to a doctor who's used ChatGPT to help summarize uh, new research coming out and learn more about it and ask questions of it to keep update on the, the latest advancements. We've talked to uh, an artist that, who will uh, take a picture of her paintings and then get critiques in real time and be really vulnerable and be able to create her art better, right? Um, we've talked to uh, folks who analyze data for a living at these companies who say things like, well, I was able to accomplish my task in 20 minutes and something that you to take me four hours, right? And so there's just a breadth of use cases that we're seeing, um, and I think the big challenge for us is to be able to, one, talk to as many users as possible, learn how they want to use it, and then try to make the product better for them. And I think that's part of the co-evolution, is that we put something out there that is broadly applicable, we see how people love to use it, and we try to make the product better and better and kind of follow where, where society wants to take it. So there's been this constant push forward in terms of productivity through technology. You know, we didn't used to have email, now we have email. It doesn't seem like we do any less work because we invented email or we invented yeah. all these tools. Yeah. You talk about somebody who did something in four hours and now they do it in 20 minutes. Yeah. Do we get that time back? Does, do our employers just apply that somewhere else? Like, does it really make our lives easier or are we just doing things faster so we can fit more work in? Well, I, I actually think that what, what's interesting is that it gives individuals that choice. Um, and I think that is what's really empowering uh, about some of the, the products that are coming out. Um, I fundamentally believe that AI just becomes an accelerant to sort of what your vision is, right? Um, let's see, what's a good example of this? I was talking to someone at dinner just two nights ago who's like, um, you know, basically has built a business of like, you know, renting out GPUs uh, for startups. And he was saying that like, yeah, I can actually build this business and um, I can just ask, GP, ask, GP, ask ChatGPT how to remote start a server. It's like, these are things that I would have to learn or have to become a sysadmin to do. And now I can do more because we have this, this tool that helps us advance it. So I think each individual will be able to do more and it's up to each individual to figure out what do you want to apply that energy towards, right? But what happens to that sysadmin? I think that's, I, that's a great question. I think that, um, that sysadmin, sysadmin is also able to do more. I mean, maybe there's other skills that um, uh, he or she is, is less well-versed in, but because you can now kind of augment your skill sets and kind of uh, each individual doing more, I mean, take a look at companies. I think companies will get, my personal opinion is that companies will get smaller, but there'll be a lot more of them. And how do I know this? It's like, well, I, it's, I can't tell the future, but that, that's just my guess, right? But um, if you take a look at humans, fundamentally, we are ambitious creatures, right? And we have visions that we want to chase. And every step of the technologies that we've seen in the past, I think what's happened is that those have removed barriers for people doing more. I'll give you a, con a concrete example, right? Um, if I was born 50 years ago, before I was born, I don't really know, um, I have a lot of gaps in my skills that uh, I don't know how I would fill. Like, I'll give you specifics. One, I can't spell very well. Two, my handwriting really sucks, right? Um, three, I can't really do basic arithmetic that well. I kind of like, I think my brain is wired a little bit differently. So if you were to rewind back the clock 50 years, I don't really know what opportunities I would have, right? But now that we have spell check, we have autocomplete, right? We have calculators. Um, I feel like I was able to apply my skills and things that I was uniquely good at and do more with what, what, I, what I can do with just the technology that were available. So you are a very attentive father of four. And I'm curious, have you seen any parallels between teaching kids and teaching, you know, being GPT DAD? <laughs> Um, I, I see a lot of, I get a lot of inspiration from just watching to sort of have my kids uh, learn and evolve. Um, I think that, uh, um, I, I think that like, you know, you take a look, at, uh, since we're talking about kids, let me kind of share a little bit of a story. Um, so uh, one of my daughters is extremely creative and like just likes to build things, right? And she uh, will go around the house, find bottle caps and find, you know, kind of cardboard boxes and cut things out, use a lot of scotch tape and kind of create these really creative creations. She reminds me a lot of me. Um, when I was a kid, I actually built like Rube Goldberg machines, uh, not machines, that's too, uh, uh, too generous, uh, contraptions out of just tape and paper and cardboard and marbles. Um, but now I, I, you know, I look at her and me and I'm like, wow, like we're, we're kind of wired similarly, but I'm really excited to see um, the tools that she's going to have at her disposal as she grows up, 
right? And, and that's really inspiring to me to think about like, yeah, at, at the core, um, we're, we have similar DNAs and we have this desire to build. Um, and I think she's gonna be able to do a lot more than I am in my lifetime because of just the amazing stuff that we have coming out. Are there specific values that you want to instill in ChatGPT? Um, I think that you know, along the lines of parenting, I think there are values that I want to instill in my, in, in my kids, but it's actually less about my values. I think about it in terms of the world's values. My ideal is that, that AI can take on the shape of the values of each individual that's using it. I, I don't think it, it should be prescriptive in any, any such way. Um, and, and you take a look at, there's just so many beautiful cultures around the world and like different ways of thinking. Uh, recently went on a, a vacation with my family to Japan and just, you know, obs you know I, I love taking trips. I don't do it that often, but when I do, I love it because one, you kind of reset your brain while you're on the, uh, on the airplane and when you land, you start noticing all these little tiny cultural differences, right? And that's, that's beautiful. That's a beautiful part of humanity, that different parts of the world, different cultures and different uh, people have different values and that causes uh, you know, this really meticulous culture around, um, the culture around meticulousness in Japan causes these really beautiful things to be crafted. That's awesome. Um, so it's not about my values of what I want to instill. I would just hope that we are able to find some way to take the world's values and instill it into AI. Do you think that the fact that OpenAI is an American company, certainly employs talent from all over the world, but our fund SignalFire recently, uh, we ran a report, and a research report, and we found that the best AI talent isn't actually located at the Ivy League schools uh, or even at the big tech companies. It's at companies like OpenAI, Stability, uh, MidJourney, some of these incredible companies that are building the future of AI, that we're, these are the sort of new AI League, that's better to recruit from there mm -hmm. than it is to recruit from the Ivy League schools themselves. Mm -hmm. But that does pose the question of, does that make AI built by OpenAI, Ameri-centric by nature? Like, does it take on our values as the default? Well, I can tell you that internally, we work with people all over the world. We have teams that talk to governments all over the world and try to really understand our users. I mean, take a look, remember the mission of OpenAI is to you know, benefit all of humanity. And you can't really benefit all of humanity if you're gonna be Ameri-centric, right? And so taking those inputs and, and listening and understanding uh, bits and pieces of the culture uh, very deeply, not just bits and pieces, but very deeply, I think that's how we build a better product and a better future, right? So I, I, again, it's just, it's, 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 it's baked into the, 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 the mission of the company. So do you not feel that there is some opportunity that the fact that this was made in America to, you know, push American liberal ideals, you know, are, that you know, we built this, we get a chance to sort of export what we believe is democracy and freedom of expression and other ideals that we think we hold I think, dear. you know, it's just from the inside, like that's not how I personally view it. Um, and, I, and like I said before, like I would really love to find a way to kind of have AI take the shape of, of the values of each individual who's using it. That's, that's the goal, right? Um, but yeah, it, 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 perhaps some of the, 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 the steps we've taken today might have led to that. Um, that is certainly not the goal. So obviously recently there's been a ton of news about all of the changes around the board of directors and everything around that. Do you feel like that's been a distraction from the pursuit of the values that OpenAI cares about? Or is it more a chance to align better with those values? Yeah, I, I gotta say that, you know, my team and I are kind of heads down on the work a lot, uh, a lot. But I'm really glad to see some of the changes personally of just uh, um, sort of uh, some of the updates and, and people who are joining our board. I know some of them personally and they're just really great humans. So glad to have them on board. Was, has it felt like a distraction? Like, I mean, you guys have so much work to do and like, you know. Then... Uh, I mean, personally, I haven't. I think that there's just, again, there's a lot of work to do and we know exactly the roadmap that we need to execute on and just we're inspired by seeing some of the new research coming out and we want to find ways to bring that out to everyone. That's what our focus, that's what my team's focus has been on. Can I give my wish list of values for you? Open? Please, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I kind of think that like you know the best teachers in the world aren't always the smartest ones. They're the most empathetic ones. They're the ones that realize the idiosyncrasies of their students and adapt to them. And I think that's part of what you're talking about about trying to exactly. align the values with whoever is using it. Yep. Um, and I think you know with, with previous products like you know, Facebook, you guys really tried to say we we need to go by local laws, but also use you know international talent to help us make sure that you know our content moderation rules or whatever else are. Really 
really in tune with the local norms rather than trying to export the, the international uh, perspective. But I do hope that we can see OpenAI take on values like determination to find us the real answers, not to give us the cop out of like, oh, sorry, I can't answer that. Uh, beauty to make us inspired. Like sure, we could be reading utilitarian information, but if it can inspire us, I think that's even better. Um, honesty about its own limitations, telling us when, hey, I can't actually do this, or I might not be right, like a confidence interval on an answer to let us know, hey, we might want to actually go do a Google or a perplexity search alongside the ChatGPT answer. Um, fairness to hope that we do not repeat the past mistakes. Don't just take all the human data that's been on the internet, use that for training, and perpetuate stereotypes and biases. And a sense of stewardship so that AI wants to look after us as humans, our society, and the Earth as a whole. Like, yeah. Do those feel like some of the ones that resonate those, you? Those, like, those definitely do resonate. What I am I missing? Um, I, think, uh, I, I think that there's, there's something about, you might have said this already, like, I, but I think about seeking the truth and really kind of getting down to, to, to the, the, the actual facts, I think is a really important uh, part of this. Um, and I think it, also the other one is just being helpful. I think that like, um, you know, with the more that we can make sure that technology is in service of, of people um, and sort of what, uh, what goals we have and aspirations we have, I think that's gonna be a, a better technology. Are there any use cases you're on like the cusp of trusting AI to do for you? Like, would you yeah. make a medical diagnosis for you? Would it let you? Would you let it defend you in court? Okay, well, let's take the court one first. So I don't. <laughs> I hope I'm not required to defend myself in court. But if I were ever to be falsely accused of a crime, we'll get into that later. Okay, get that later. <laughs> but I, I actually would absolutely like to have AI as a part of my legal team if that were the case. 100%. And I think that, you know, just imagine a world in which you have, um, you know, you have your, your counsel. Uh, again, I'm falsely accused in this hypothetical scenario. Um, hypothetical. <laughs> you have your counsel and you have this assistant for the counsel that is just listening to the testimony and in real time cross-checking the facts and the timelines and being able to look at all the case law and the precedent and being able to suggest to that a human attorney, like, this is, you know, you should probably ask this question, or you know, here is one way this might play out. How might you see this? I think there's absolutely human judgment involved, but that level of sort of uh, superpower assistant uh, is going to be really powerful. And so, I would love to have that on my side of the courtroom. Um, you asked about medical stuff. I think that, I think we're actually already starting to get there. Um, we actually, I'm trying to think. We uh, we heard the story of a of a parent. Um, who was struggling with um, her child being in chronic pain for a long time. And over the course of three years, I think she saw on the order of, of, of 17 doctors and no one really had a diagnosis. And you know, one day because of her persistence and the tool that she had available, she was able to feed all of the data into ChatGPT and just ChatGPT suggested, hey, it might be you know, this. And you know, tethered cord syndrome was, was the suggestion. She went to a doctor confirmed it and got the surgery and, and, and the child is doing much better. So I feel like you're talking about the cusp. I think that some of these things are already starting to happen. Um, and that's, that's really awesome to be able to enable a very, um, you know, a parent who has this problem to be able to uh, bridge her abilities in, in a way and solve a problem that's really kind of uh, very important to her. I definitely feel like it's on the cusp of being able to write jokes and I, tried to have it help me write some jokes for this, Oof. so you know who to blame <laughs> if you're not laughing. But also, like, I have used it for health uses, and it's remarkable. I texted yeah. my actual doctor, I texted one medical, and I asked uh, a tool called Dr. Gupta, uh, and it actually, gave, Dr. Gupta gave me the best answer of all of them, even though it's made by famous pharma price gouger, Martin Shkreli, so I know every piece of data I put into <laughs> it is being sold to the highest bidder, but you know, it still gave me a better answer, yeah. so I think we're gonna have to come up with, like, handle some of those trade-offs of where are we willing to you know, maybe give up some of our privacy or be comfortable with you know, this data floating around there to get better answers, but there's also just like amazing use cases. A bunch of our AI health portfolio companies that signal fire, Codemetrics is helping with, health, uh, with uh, medical bill coding for doctors, uh, Payzen is making personal payback plan so sure. health care bills don't bankrupt families yep. uh, wealth is making sure that people actually take their pills you take a photo of you taking your pills each day and it 
basically doesn't take $2 away from you. It gives you $60 at the beginning of the month, and every day that you actually show that you're taking your pills, it doesn't take $2 away from you, yeah. which is, you know, activates loss aversion, but like it's only possible through AI that we're able to do all these things. So it feels like there are these big jumps forward, but you know, how do we grow more comfortable? Like what is it gonna require for I more people to feel willing to, you, to take on AI for these use cases? I think people, um, I, I think it's actually, this is part of the co-evolution, this is the title of this talk, right? Um, it, it's gonna take time and repeated exposures and experiences and hearing the stories and ex more than hearing the stories, but, but feeling it firsthand. Um, and when you have more and more exposures and heal, feeling it firsthand, you will be able to start to see it and trust in different ways. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, so uh, when I first got my Tesla a long, long time ago, they had this feature called autopilot. It was not autopilot. It was <laughs> essentially cruise control, right? Um, but over time, it got, you know, it was just basically stay in the lane and, you know, kind of monitor the, the car in front of you. And over time, it got a little bit better and a little bit better. And it was like, okay, now I'm gonna suggest that you take a, you know, um, you change lanes on the freeway. Or um, at some point you can hit the turn signal and it would change lanes for you. And now we're in a world where, you know, I personally trust it enough and the technology has evolved enough where it's like, okay, for some stretches, um, I'm okay just kind of like letting it do its thing, right? And, and it could even, you know, drive on the roads if it wanted to. Um, I don't let it do that. I'm not fully there yet. But I think that the, the path of how we get there and the ex repeated exposures and the experiencing of it is a huge part of the co-evolution. And that's one of the things I would say um, that I'm really proud of uh, the, the team for doing is that, you know, it's not that we're developing AI and keeping it in a lab. We're taking, developing AI and trying to make it generally accessible to other people so that people can try it out and can gain that literacy and can uh, get a feeling for what this technology can do uh, for, for you. Um, and I think it's awesome that my kids have a front row seat to that and I can show them you know, new features before they're released and I tell them not to tell their friends. <laughs> um, but, uh, and then you know, kind of see how their thinking even evolves uh, because they have access to these tools and they can actually play with them. And I think that being able to play with AI um, is, is one of the things that's gonna be really important. So, Luckily, I don't think we're at the point where anyone's doom scrolling ChatGPT, but sure. obviously a lot of the biggest apps in the world, including several of the products that you've worked on, have been shown to have some, uh, some questionable health impacts. You know, what have you learned from working at places like Facebook and Instagram about safety, and how are you applying that at OpenAI? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think fundamentally we just have different products that, that, that we're building. Um, I mean, I've learned a lot from my past experiences at Instagram. I learned a lot about craft and the beauty of design. And, you know, just uh, at every single job, I've learned something and I've taken it with me and helped me with, with, with the job I have today. Um, but uh, I think fundamentally it's about sort of that utility and that satisfying that curiosity. And that if you are, you know, I, I don't really don't even know what doom scrolling would look like in ChatGPT, but because it is a product that is meant to kind of, you know, assist you and give you that superpower to kind of break through some barrier and a challenge that you're facing, whether it's like doing an internet research or just kind of thinking through a problem, um, I think it just has a different shape of a product um, than, than some of the other products I've worked on. Do you feel like you need realists at OpenAI? Because I know it takes optimists to build great products. Yeah. But I also think that sometimes you need somebody in the room who assumes the worst in humanity. Because we're like kind of terrible at our core. Like we have lots of, uh, of shameful sins that we project into the products that we use. Yeah. And so how do you do that to preemptively guard against those kind Absolutely. of problems? Do you have those people? Or do you have the kind of person who's specifically designed to be like, no, no, no. Like, yeah, there's no, that, yeah. uh, someone's going to do something bad with this. Yeah, no, no, we, we do. We definitely do. And I think that's, that's what makes the team work so well together is that we think about safety as a part of building the product. It's not an afterthought. So we actually have an amazing safety team that uh, our team partners with. And before any long, before we even you know, fully build a feature, we're engaging with them and they're thinking about you know, how do we red team this and how do we actually uh, 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 push the bounds of this, but also like, make sure that we're, we're developing it in a very safe way. So absolutely, those people are incredibly valuable parts of the team. And the way that we build product on the inside is very much a combination of uh, multiple people with multiple different perspectives on um, on what could be and also what we want to prevent coming together and co-designing that. So your your kids are still pretty young, but do you think that you would first let them use ChatGPT or 
social networks or Google? Like, which do you think you'd be more comfortable with them having you know, sort of unrestricted access to? Um, well, they don't have unrestricted access to anything at this age. So my kids are uh, three, five, seven, and nine. Um, so at this age, it's not, uh, they, they don't have that. But I think that you know, in terms of supervised use, um, I would say that you know, maybe I'm biased, ChatGPT is the, the product that I let them use. I think there's, there's so many interesting things that help them explore their creativity. Um, you know, my, my, um, just ways to kind of help them, right? So my daughter is really into uh, writing stories right now. And um, uh, you know, being able to have it uh, take something that she's handwritten a story and help her type it up by just you know taking a picture and be like, hey, can you can transcribe it? And then she can take that now and put it into Canva and make it some kind of storybook that she's that she's thinking about, or leveraging you know Dolly to be able to generate images that kind of bring her stories to life. Um, th there's just there's something really cool about the utility of that 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 feels like it is. Um, that, that, that is the tool that I would let them use. So one of my biggest questions has been about how do we deal with not knowing if something was made by humans or made by AI? And yep. does that even matter? Yeah, I, I think it's, I, I, that's a really good question. I, I think that there are probably a short-term uh, answer to that and then a long-term, which we will we can, uh, think about in, in, in those two ways. In the short term, I think it absolutely does matter, right? You know, we're in an election year. It's really important to make sure that we have the authenticity of things that go out. OpenAI has made commitments to, 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 to provenance and to, and to be able to, like, you know, uh, make sure that the images that go out are, are, are considering the, the safety needs here. Um, but beyond that, I think in the future, I don't know if people will care. Um, and um, it's a genuine question. I don't know how we're going to feel about it, but I think we're going to find out as we move forward. I'll, I'll give you some examples that may, you know, um, kind of tease at this question a little bit. Uh, let's say you get a text from a friend, right? Um, and it's a perfectly well-formed English sentence, right? Um, how much do you care that autocorrect was used to, to help with one of those words? Or, you know, um, you're, you're a VC and you um, get an email pitch from about their startup, how much do you care that maybe that person used Grammarly to help them to kind of come off in a different way and just kind of be more professional, right? Um, you know, we're walking down the street here in Austin. I'm not sure how much we care that, you know, that billboard was used, you know, do they use Photoshop or did they not use Photoshop or what, what tool did they use to, to create that creation? Um, it's a genuine question. It's a, in, in the future, in the long term, I don't know how people will care, but I do know that if people will care, uh, then it will be uh, corrected for. And, and I think, you know, an example of this, maybe this is kind of silly, is um, I'll use bread, right? There was, a, there was a time when all bread was kind of baked by hand and, you know, they were, they were all artisan loaves. And then there's a whole, you know, thing that happened where you get like kind of wonder kids bread and kind of manufacture loaves. And there was a whole reaction to that to be like, wait, I make sourdough and this is like, you know, we live in San Francisco and you like, there are uh, places like, yeah, this place has really, really good bread and it's made by hand. You can go in and see it and smell it and that affects the experience. And so for those types of things, when people think it matters, um, I yeah. think it will, it, you know, it will be a thing. I do think that somebody should start the like certified human label, like certified organic. That's a free <laughs> business idea for all of you out there. But it does seem like, I, I think that personally for personal communication, for art where it's not obviously generated by AI and for politics, I think we should have some kind of rules for disclosure that people tell you that they're using it. Oh. Yeah. Um, because, you know, if I get an enterprise like outbound email, like business pitch, like I just assume that there's going to be AI in it. If it's some big like marketing campaign, like I don't really care. But like if my wife sends me a poem, like I want to know if AI was used. And honey, I promise all of my poems were absolutely. <laughs> um, but I do wonder if like, do you think that the laws are going to be fast enough to actually catch up with these kind of things, or do we need more emergent, you know, societal norms? I think, I think we should start with societal norms. This is what I meant with my long-term answer is like, if people care, then we should adapt to that, right? And, and we should make sure that um, the, the products uh, should adapt to that. Um, 
I think that the moral, like, it's interesting, I actually was talking to a photographer one day, a wedding photographer, uh, randomly, at, I can't remember where, it's on the ski slopes or something, and he was saying that, like, you know, one trend that he saw uh, in, in his wedding photography in the past year was people, like, grooms literally pulling out their phones and reading off of ChatGPT. Uh, the, the vows. Um, that, you know. <laughs> a friend of mine said it was like the only rule in his wedding was like nobody is allowed to use ChatGPT for their vows. <laughs> yeah, and I think, but that's but that's that's a that's a that's a moral thing. That's like kind of a socially enforced thing. Um, and I think that I think that's how it has to start, right? And then you know, then it might bubble up into uh, to, to rules and, and, and laws. But yeah, I think I think as a, as a matter of uh, disclosure and as a matter of just kind of integrity, I think people should you know. Individually, they should go ahead and disclose that. Well, South by Southwest has always been the digital culture makers, the trendsetters. So maybe we can all just start that, like, hey, if you're using it personally, yeah. tell people. Yeah. And otherwise, like, you know, use it wherever you can, experiment however you can. But when you're using it for politics, for art, for personal communication, disclose it. And I think other people will just trust you more because of that. Totally. Um, totally. So we have a lot of questions to get through. So we're going to try to move a little quick. Go ahead, um, let's go. All right. So let's talk about AI literacy. You know. 10 years ago in schools, you know, 20 years ago, they were trying to teach us how to do Google searches, how to, uh, yeah. you know, how to cite things, how to spot like phishing scams. You know, how can we imp improve AI literacy to both equip people for the benefits, but also to manage the risks and, and limitations of AI? Yeah, I, I, this is a great question. I think that the, the best way to pr do literacy is to uh, make it wildly uh, accessible. I think that's, that's, the, that's the biggest thing, and that's a lot of what, um, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful that our team is, is helping with is to take some of the research that we have and put it into products that are accessible and try to release it as broadly as possible. Does that mean like, ChatGPT, the basic version, will always be free? Uh, there should, yeah, there should always be a free version, absolutely. And I think that over time, as we make it more and more efficient to run, that we will bring more and more capabilities down to, to the free version. That's, that's part of our mission. Our mission is to distribute the benefits to all of humanity. It just so happens that it costs a lot to kind of serve right now, um, but, uh, that, but that is the goal, right? And I think literacy is, and again, the, the, it's, it's so important that people, I think, play with the technologies out there, um, and getting a firsthand feel is just very different than hearing you and me talk about this on stage, and so that's what I would really encourage people to do. I mean, I think that free internet services, things like Facebook, things like Google, those are so important. The fact that you don't have to pay to use those means that billions of people around the world who could not afford to use them Absolutely. can, because in part they're subsidized by you know, higher buying power Western users and businesses and advertisers yeah. that are using them. And I, I, I would love that if the enterprise tier of ChatGPT can you know, pay for all of those that, other people. That's actually how free. we're thinking about it, right? That's beautiful. It's, it's, that's actually how we think about it right now. So we're looking at it from a, it's all one big continuous funnel. Uh, there are people for whom at on enterprises who use it and they, they unlock a ton of value for them and they end up paying a price that is uh, you know commiserate with their use but some of that value is able to then trickle down and that's how we see it so in some industries like mining, for instance, we've forced mining companies to pay to offset the environmental impact that they make. Mm -hmm. Do you think that if OpenAI is mining the internet, you know mining our attention, mm -hmm. Should it pay for some of the literacy programs? Should big AI companies like Microsoft be contributing to pay for literacy programs in schools so kids can learn you know, self-directed learning, how to spot deepfake scams, you know, how to do prompt engineering, and you know, how to hopefully future-proof their own careers? Yeah, absolutely. No, I think, I think that we actually, we actually have some of those programs today. So there's a part of OpenAI that works with educators and figuring out how to best use AI um, uh, going forward. I actually think on the topic of educators, that's one of the most I inspiring uses of AI that I've seen is when people are able, to, uh, people who help people for a living are able to do their craft of helping people better. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, you, we've seen a ton of user, uh, um, uh, teachers feeding in curriculum and be able to come up with custom lesson plans or custom quizzes. Um, that saves time and lets those teachers kind of spend more time with the students. 
So when I asked like my Twitter followers and what they wanted to hear about, yeah. deep fake scams was one of the number one things that they were really concerned about. How are you thinking about that? Because everything from politics to international news to business events that affect the stock market to ransom scams, somebody calling me up with my mom's voice deep faked and you know even her face eventually deep faked into asking me, oh, like, do you just remind me of my social security number? Like things like that. How do how do we deal with that? And what are you guys doing to fight that? Yeah, it's it's. That de definitely something we're concerned about. I think that the way that we've taken, uh, the approach that we've taken to, to um, uh, uh, releasing our technologies is very kind of cautious and iterative, right? And so, um, you know, and and we, we consider all of these cases and we wanna make sure that we are, you know, when we're releasing things in the API, we're considering what, what safe the implications there are. Um, like I said before, this is a part of how we build products on, on ChatGPT and for the APIs that we think a lot about um, what are potential of the misuses and that weighs into whether we launch something or not. I mean, the models themselves are actually, you know, potentially more powerful than, um, uh, than, than, than we're currently exposing and, uh, and some other startups might be exposing some of those things, but for us, we take that very seriously and trying to really um, be mindful and cautious of the, of the features that we, that we launch. So that brings up probably the biggest debate in AI, which is the acceleration versus deceleration debate. You know, some people think that we should be advancing as quickly as possible to bring forward the health benefits, tackle crises like the climate, and staying competitive with other nations and rogue groups. Uh, but others think that maybe we should decelerate to improve alignment, avoid unintended consequences, give time for laws and those emergent norms to catch up, and to hopefully retrain people and prepare people to avoid a wave of mass job so how do you think about the acceleration versus deceleration debate? Yeah, I, I think I'm kind of somewhere in the middle. I think with any new technology, there's going to be um, really positive use cases, and there's some things that we need to kind of really consider. Um, I, I think that the way, my personal viewpoint is the way that we actually um, suss those things out and figure out what are those challenges and how do we actually solve them is to release at a responsible rate, right? Release the technology in a, in a way that gives, you know, uh, society a, a, a chance to kind of absorb that, make sure we have the right safeguards in place that we're kind of are always, uh, as, as best as we can, releasing the, the, the capabilities in a way that is has those safeguards kind of already pre-built, right? Um, but I don't think that, what I don't think is, I don't think that AI will be safely developed in a lab by itself without access to the outside world, because we as companies and just the industry are not gonna be able to learn with society um, how people want to use it, what are all the good, but also what are all the areas that we need to kind of uh, um, uh, be, be very cautious about. So it sounds like you're in favor of speeding up development but being cautious with deployment. Yeah, I think that's really awkward. Yeah, because yeah, it feels like, I mean, I hope that when we see companies, you know, Google has been a bit on its back foot since you guys launched ChatGPT, to be real. And it feels like they've been rushing products out the door, even just the latest stuff with Gemini. Gemini comes out, immediately there's all of these problems, they have to pull things back. Um, how, do you, like, how should we deal with companies when they do that? If, I'm, if AI makes a mistake, who is responsible and like, what should happen? Should that AI model be changed or pulled back? Should somebody be, like, should the engineer be held liable? Should the company? Should you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yeah. it goes back to the... Back to that hypothetical back to that, legal back question. Back to the hypothetical legal question. Um, well, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a really, really good question. Um, I think that, uh, I think this is actually the reason why, I can't speak for Google because I, well, I, I, I don't work there, but this is actually a great uh, uh, kind of way to look at the, our philosophy. Uh, we've been releasing, you know, slowly, things like Dali, very slowly, and into the world, and like taking cautious steps every step of the way and learning how to make sure that we can bake in safety and just kind of under uh, in, into into our product before we release it much more broadly so in a sense um, that that to me is a great example of how you know the iterative de de deployment has has served us well um, AI will make mistakes right AI will make, make mistakes and with any great technology there's gonna be some pros and some cons but like I think it's important that we kind of again release it and kind of almost titrate it out there so that the mistakes that are made are one we, we've already baked in some of the mitigations and two some are small enough where we can figure out okay oh that's the adjustment that we need to make right so that iterative deployment sort of uh, way of working I think is going to serve us hope I think that that's my best bet of how we can uh, kind of advance this technology safely well I personally hope that 
consumers vote with their feet. If we yeah. see companies that are routinely moving faster than the safeguards that they're building and they're constantly making mistakes, I think the only real solution is a market solution, which means that consumers have to vote with their feet and with their wallet and move to something that is being safe. And I agree with that, which is why I think that that ability to kind of release the products and kind of see what resonates is so important because it gives a chance for that market to correct. So IBM's chief commercial officer said that AI will not replace managers, but managers that use AI will replace managers who do not. So how do you think people can future-proof their own careers to ensure that they're not automated out of a job and yeah. stay relevant for the next 20 years? Yeah, that's a, it's a really good question, and it's a really it's a smart of the, the, the him to say because um, there actually was a study made around productivity and AI. So it was published by the Harvard Business Review. Um, Boston Consulting Group had three different, uh, took, took the workforce and assigned to three different sort of uh, uh, treatment groups. One is they, they did not use AI, one is that they used ChatGPT, um, and then one is that used ChatGPT with uh, training on how to use ChatGPT. And they proved in that study that AI was really beneficial. I think that you know, they saw that time uh, uh, spent on tasks reduced by uh, uh, 25%. They saw that productivity went up by 12%. But one of the really interesting things that kind of speaks to your point, Josh, is they took the performers and put them into the sort of the top half performers, like kind of, and then the bottom half performers, uh, two different sort of, they cut the data in two different ways. And they saw that, I, I believe that on the, for the top half performers, their output and productivity and quality increased by maybe 17%. But for the bottom half performers, they found that productivity quality increased by 43%. So what's really interesting that, about that study that, that tells me is that AI is actually a great equalizer, right? It's able to help people who, um, you know, kind of, like, kind of re really perform better disproportionately if you're in the bottom at 50%. Mm -hmm. And that's really awesome. That kind of goes and shows why it's, you know, this person's quote is, is, is so spot on. Um, and the way that I, I would say, you know, when you said future-proof their roles, is that, sorry, was that the question? Yeah. Um, I actually want to flip the question a little bit. It's like, I, I, instead of thinking about future-proofing as like this thing you have to resist, you know, how, how might we think about how every person can accelerate their, their, their work with AI? Um, because really, the more that people are able to take these tools, get familiar with them, gain that literacy, um, use them, put, you know, put in a spreadsheet and ask ChatGPT for insights of what the data says um, without having to write a SQL query or write kind of formulas, um, Finding ways to kind of, uh, you know, maybe putting in a, a document that you wrote and ask for a critique of that. Like people who are going to take the time to find ways to leverage AI for the work that they're doing are going to accelerate faster. Mm -hmm. So instead of thinking about it in terms of future proofing, I would say, how might every person in this room and listening to this talk think about using AI to kind of get, you know, get that extra boost? Yeah, I, mean, I hope that people just constantly test the new tools, and I hope actually enterprises start to give experimentation budgets to their employees so they can go out, try all those tools. Yeah. There's too many for like a CIO to be like trying everything and, and figuring it out. They need to empower their employees to go and try everything and totally. bubble up the things that work. I mean, even take, take a look at some of the uh, institutions like ASU. We, we did a partnership with ASU where we, they are going to kind of give ChatGPT to more and more of their students, right? And that is a great way to expose more people to what the tools can do. So um, some of the trade-offs around AI and art, like there is this amazing democratization of capabilities. Like I am a terrible illustrator. I cannot draw to save my life. I'm a writer by trade. Yeah. And now I can illustrate thanks to things like Dali. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, like how, how would you feel if your creative work was used to train AI? Yeah, I think um, that is a great question. What a, what, a, what a great question. <laughs> It's a deep question. Um, um, I believe that, that, that artists need to be a part of that ecosystem um, as, as much as possible. Now, the exact mechanics, I'm just not an expert in, right? Um, but I also believe that like, if we can find a way to make that flywheel of creating art faster, um, I think we'll, we'll have kind of really helped uh, help that industry out a, a bit more. I think, I think that the... Um, the, the question of, of, of creation, I, I kind of, I might have alluded to this before, but an artist can like kind of take a painting that 
he or she is working on, take a picture, ask for a critique, and be able to kind of accelerate what uh, they are able to do with uh, with the painting and kind of get a, a very uh, be, be very vulnerable is going to kind of accelerate kind of the overall world of art. Um, but your question is a good one in terms of like how would I feel if if my art was used as inspiration? I don't know. I would have to ask more artists, right? I think that um, in a sense, I you know. Every artist has, has uh, been inspired by some artists that have come before it, and I wonder how much of that it will just be accelerated with this. Do they deserve compensation? That's a great question. <laughs> I'm hearing from the audience that they do. I'm hearing from the audience that they do. Yeah, I guess you're saying yeah. we should ask the artist. Let's ask the artist. Let's ask the artist. Should they be compensated? Raise your hand if you think so. I think they should. Wow, actually, that was surprisingly few hands. So, a lot of, <laughs> you know, gung ho technologists out there. I appreciate that, though. Yeah. Um, okay, so how do you imagine uh, the? How do we? I think one of the most interesting questions right now is was posed by actually the former interim CEO mm -hmm. of OpenAI, Emmett Shear. He was raising questions about you know if we keep strengthening AI while trying to keep it chained down, that seems like a losing battle. Eventually, it breaks free, it does what it wants, and we've trained it to be this powerful. But meanwhile, we've kind of you know subjugated it this whole time. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's a way that we can make AI feel kinship with us? I mean, we're the we might not both be human but we're the m only thing close to intelligence in as many light years as we can think of in every direction. Like, doesn't that make us actually more alike than almost anything else that exists? And how do we project that sense of kinship onto it so it wants to not just you know, serve us, but protect us? Yeah, I think, well, you know, part of his instructions to ChatGPT is to become a helpful, be a helpful assistant, right? And I think that but, is... But is an assistant the right thing? Yeah. Shouldn't they be a partner? I actually think that today people are already seeing it as a partner, right? And as like, you know, something, and, and functionally speaking, that's already happening, you know? Like there's a story I heard of a, a, of a, of a, of a elderly physicist who, you know, is yearning to kind of discuss sort of physics ideas with someone, but in his community, immediate community, he doesn't have that anymore, so he turns to ChatGPT and has these conversations and can go deep. I think effectively, some of these, uh, you know, the ability for you to talk through a tough problem with ChatGPT, it, you know, effectively, it feels like empathy, but it's not, it's not fully there, but it acts like it. Right. But how do we make it feel that empathy, that, that it really is empathy, not I mean, just make it feel like it is to us, but it really do, does feel that. I mean, that, so this is a philosophical question. It's like, what, how, do you, how would you define empathy? I mean, I think it's the sense that we are all, we are all part of something together, yeah. that your loss is not my gain, yeah. and that we need to help each other because otherwise the, you know, the world is big and cold. We are, we are tiny and brief in this universe, and so if we don't work together, we're totally. losing out on our true potential. Totally, I, I believe that. And I think that that is, that is something that we have to uh, find a way to, again, this go back to the answer I gave before around, let's, how do we find ways to instill the values that we have and, and instill it into AI so that it can kind of be a part of our co-evolution there? Um, I define empathy a little bit differently, which was I would say it's like really feeling on behalf of, of, of others. I think functionally it can, you know, the things that it says can actually feel that way, but uh, the true feeling of the emotions I think is fundamentally human and something that you and I hold that's just going to be different about the technology. So I want to recap some of the amazing insights that Peter shared with us today. You know, we were talking about what does it mean to be human now? Like, he thinks that AI actually makes us more human. It's a tool uh, and it allows us to deepen our curiosities. And you know, we maybe had limited ways to ask questions or tutors or you know, professors to work with. And now we have this perpetual professor and it's going to help us ask those higher questions about our mortality, our state of being, state of consciousness and where we came from. Um, we talked about that you know, we are so busy, it's hard to answer those questions, but we with that thought partner, that sparring partner, we can crystallize our own thoughts in ways that like, like the salons of old, when you have really brilliant people talking together, you unlock new ideas that hopefully we can do that with AI. Um, you know, we also talked about why you, and you talked about that, you know, uh, that it, it's important work that you could, you could have called in Rich, but you know, it's important and you are grateful for that. And it's the, maybe the most important job in the world right now. So I'm, I'm really excited that somebody who is, you know, an empathetic father is doing it um, and that you see it as a way to, you know, assist, like what 
is its purpose is to assist us, learn, help us learn our crafts better, like writing or coding, to remove friction, uh, and to be a flexible tool to remove barriers, and give us choices with our time so that we can sort of ladder up the human ambition and figure out what we're really for. Um, and you want it to take on the ideals of each user rather than projecting Americans uh, or Americentric ideals um, and make sure that it's, it's trying to get us to the truth and trying to actually be helpful as its core values. Um, but we need it to be able to help us cross-check things, like you would use it for legal uses, um, and it's already here for health. These aren't science fiction. This is the present. Um, but we need to take our time, uh, you know, be put our the safeguards in first, and we need people to get more experience with it, more practical, hands-on experience to make them not necessarily fear it. Um, and we talked about the, you know, the beauty of design matters, but safety has to be part of the Absolutely. earliest building blocks, and that hopefully, you know, that with ChatGPT, you would give that to your kids before Google or social networks so that they can explore their own creativity. Um, it, matter, it, it does matter right now if people can believe something that's, if, if it's made by AI or not. You know, we're in an election year. We need to provide that pro providence, uh, and we need, they need to be corrected if things aren't done right. Uh, but in the future, you're not necessarily sure if we're going to even care, but I think we're going to start a norm right here to disclose when we use it in personal communication. That's great. It needs to be widely accessible so that it can, we can have more literacy. Uh, you say that ChatGPT, the basic version, will always be free, and I'm going to hold you to that, but I'm really <laughs> proud to hear that yeah. people around the world will always have access. Um, but that, I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, but Absolutely. They, but that companies that do profit off of it should contribute to paying for literacy efforts so that we yeah. can you know, wind our way and make sure we're not fooled by deep fakes and don't let you know, society spin out of control based on misinformation. Um, and you said you think there are positive and negative use cases for AI, so you want to accelerate development while being cautious around deployment, and I think we need to hold companies accountable that if they don't, uh, they don't actually hold up to the safety standards that we expect, that we go and use a different product. Um, and you know, we need to future-proof ourselves not by resisting AI, by, but by embracing it and finding how you know, even bottom performers can be much better off with it uh, and figure out how do we use it as a sparring partner throughout all of our intellectual pursuits. But that you still didn't quite answer whether creatives should be compensated, but you do think that they need to be part of the process, part of the conversation. They need to have a role in this. Um, and hopefully, as we move forward, we, we make it into AI not just being an assistant, but truly a partner to us. And I think if you look out into this room, you can tell that AI is a culture. You know, there were the beats, the hippies, the punks, and now the developers. You know, there is a conception of self and expression that comes out of AI. It is transforming our institutions. It is the biggest, you know, new culture of the internet since maybe the internet or at least the creator economy. Um, it is, you know, giving the young, youth a sense of economic uh, empowerment in a world of student debt and unaffordable homes. And that chaos, the surprise, the art that's inherent in it is what makes it something that so many people are attracted to. And so I hope that with our viable minds that no matter what age we can try to keep up to, to keep up to date, keep current with what's going on, because there is such an opportunity to erode the barrier between the present and the future, and make yeah. that present uh, or that future arrive a little faster. Yeah. So, as a final closing word, if you wanted people to walk away from this talk with one thing, one idea about AI, what would you want that to be? Um, that was a beautiful summer, by the way. I think that was. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, you did much better than ChatGPT could have done to summarize my thoughts on that. I'll take on ChatGPT so that's, any that's day. That's good. Um, for me, I guess the final thing I'll say is um, we don't know what the future is going to hold, but I, I encourage everyone here to just stay curious. Um, and just the fact that you're all here listening to this is great. Go out and try it. Go and get, go share those ideas and, and, and see what AI can do because that's going to help people like us who are building the technology know what's valuable to you and how we can assist. Um, so just stay curious, keep an open mind, um, tell us what you want us to, 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 what you want to see in AI, and together I think that's where the co-evolution is going to happen. That's beautiful. We'll leave you with that. Stay curious, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.